I am honored to introduce our speaker, Ma'am Desa Marie Antoinette P. Fernandez. Ma'am Des graduated from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, in her hometown of Los Baños here in Laguna with a Bachelor of Science in Biology, major in Wildlife Biology in 2010, and then a Master of Science in Wildlife Studies, minor in Forest Resources Management in 2015. Currently, she is an Assistant Professor 5 at the Animal Biology Division of the Institute of Biological Sciences uh, here at UPLB. And she sits on the Board of Trustees of the Biodiversity Conservation Society of the Philippines. She is a member of the Asian Wildcat Conservation Network and of the Wildlife Disease Association Asia Pacific Section. She teaches courses on wildlife biology and zoology and has written numerous publications on the ecology, systematics, and diseases of carnivorans and other wildlife. So everybody, let's all give Mam Des Fernandez a very big virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thank Des. you very much, Kuya Flor. Okay, so our seminar for today is about uh, updates on the study of Philippine carnivorans. So this is not going to be an exhaustive uh, literature review, but I will just present very recent studies and uh, focus on studies that I have been involved with. Okay. So this is my very long name, but you can call me Mam Des for short. And um, so what are carnivorans? So carnivorans, these are mammals of the order carnivora, that's their name. And even if they sound like they are all carnivores, okay, the five families in the Philippines actually have varied dietary preferences. So from hypercarnivores such as the rodent-eating leopard cat to the fig-dependent pinturong, and everything in between, like the omnivorous uh, common palm civet that you can see here in this picture. And this means that they provide valuable ecosystem services. So for example, the leopard cat eats mostly non-native rodents. So they are a good um, pest control agent. And those that are more frugivorous that eat seeds also disperse their seeds. And Unfortunately, they're often cryptic and nocturnal. So you can see here in this picture, this is a photo of a civet that was spotlighted in the evening. So them being cryptic and nocturnal makes them difficult to find and therefore difficult to study. So compared to maybe other uh, taxa like rodents and bats, uh, there aren't a lot of studies about carnivorans in the Philippines because of this reason. Now there are seven, for now, carnivorous species that I will discuss, but I will uh, also discuss a mystery eighth that you may already know of from the news last year. So there's the common palm civet, sometimes called the alamid, sometimes called it's, it's called mosang, depending on the region. And this is Paradoxorus philippinensis. You may remember a different scientific name for this if you studied wildlife maybe five or 10 years ago, but I'll explain later why the name has changed. Another viverid is the Malay civet or musang. Sometimes it's also called alamid, sometimes alamus sila together. And also the lovely binturong, Arctis binturong, no longer Arctis binturong wite, which I will also discuss later. The lovely Sunda leopard cat. So you may remember this being either the Palawan leopard cat or the Visayan leopard cat. So there are also changes to the taxonomy of the Sunda leopard cat, which is Prianilurus javanensis, no longer uh, bengalensis. And then we have the Asian small clawed otter. The Palawan stink badger, also called pantot for a very obvious reason. <laughs> and the collared bongus, which is possibly one, the most understudied of all of these carnivorans. Okay, so we will start going through them one by one. And we start, of course, with the common palm civet. The common palm civet, by, as the name implies, is one of, if not the most common carnivoran here in the Philippines that is 
native or naturalized because uh, the ones in Palawan are naturally distributed, but there is a study and a theory that those in the oceanic Philippines have been uh, distributed by human trade or uh, maybe in, uh, by human activity. So Veron et al. split Paradoxerus hermaphroditus into three species. Hermaphroditus remains as the Indian and Indochinese populations. Musangus has a uh, mainline south is the one from mainland Southeast Asia, Sumatra, Java, and other small Indonesian islands. And they determined that uh, the ones from Mentawai, Borneo, and the Philippines should be called a different species, Paradoxerus philippinensis. And this scientific name has actually been already used by Haney et al. in his book, uh, Mammals of Luzon Island. And in turn, we have also used it in our publication just last year. And this publication is a result of the Makiling Civet Project. Phase one was led by uh, my forever advisor, Dr. De Gia, and uh, phase two is being led by myself. Now, this is the first in-depth study that we know of on the common palm civet in the Philippines. So what we did is we did spotlighting, cage trapping, diet analysis, and an endoparasite survey for phase one. And so this is our transect here. Okay, we laid this out in Mount Makiling. This is transect two. And these are the cages that we set. So in our spotlighting, we were able to capture some eye shine. Okay, so this is about at Count Malab Camp Malabo. So that's an eye shine of a palm civet. Hindi lang siya kita sa camera, pero in real life, you can see that it's really a civet. And of course, we also set traps here. And we have captured a few individuals. So this is one of them. We sedate them. Okay, so this is our lovely veterinarian, si Doc Rina, who is always assisting us in our projects. And we examine their physical condition and take their morphometrics. And then we also analyze their diet. And you can see here some of the seeds that we isolated. So these are figs. This is a nahau, and this is a kind of palm. And one part of their diet that is very famous but glaringly absent in the specimens in Mount Makiling, in both the specimens of thesis collected in the Civet Project and in one of the thesis, undergrad thesis of my students, Dwight Dandoy, is that there is no coffee. So civets are famous for being producers of the most expensive coffee in the world, which is coffee kape alamid or coffee luwak. And in Mount Makiling, it seems that their preferred diet is not coffee at all, but more uh, native fruits such as ficus, anahaw, and their most dominant uh, food item is actually yung saging maching. Yung saging na may seed sa loob. So that's their preferred uh, food actually in Mount Pakiling. This is even though we conducted part of our study in an area that has ripe coffee fruits at the time, uh, we still didn't find any um, coffee in their diet. So maybe coffee is not their preferred, but they became famous for it, at least in Mount Pakiling. So you will see here that most of the signs of presences, itong uh, red stars, are found in the higher elevations of Mount Makiling and then konti lang sa lower elevations. So some of our activities or maybe food availability is pushing them to only occupy a limited area, at least in Mount Makiling. So for phase two, we also did some uh, testing for uh, parasites and some GPS tracking, but I won't present that for now because we're still working on the report and paper for that. And also we are working on a policy paper that we will hopefully present to the administration of MCMP, MCME within this year. Because in the phase two study, we also studied the GPS tracking of the domestic animals in Mount Makiling. So we have cats and dogs in Mount Makiling that may interact with our native civet species. And this may cause um, 
competition or even possibly disease transmission. So we're not presenting that for now, but maybe stay tuned for uh, more results on that phase two of our project. So for the Malay civet, uh, there are no focus studies on that right now. So they occur in the Malay Peninsula, as their name implies, up to Sulawesi and the Philippines. As I mentioned, not many studies in the Philippines, only a few recent reports, such as that from Esselstyn. So they captured and observed uh, individuals in Puerto Princesa and Aborlan, Palawan. And Esselstyn in this paper, actually, uh, they make a lot of reports for other carnivorans. So I won't mention this paper over and over again. So if you want to read more about mammals of Palawan in general, this is a good reference. Marler et al. also did uh, photography using camera traps in Cleopatra's needle critical habitat. So they did find Malay civets and as well as other carnivorans. So that's another resource for reading about the presence of carnivorans, particularly in Cleopatra's needle. And then also uh, myself and my good friend, uh, Ace Amarga, uh, we made a short note about accidentally capturing them by a mist net. So mist net is usually for capturing birds and bats. But unfortunately, this highlights the fact that you really have to be um, vigilant with your net. So kailangan nyo talagang bantayan yung mist nets carefully because hindi lang tao yung pwedeng kumuha ng bats nyo. Uh, other predators such as this poor Malay civet can also be entangled in your nets in the attempt to um, maybe capture the bats for food. So don't worry, he was released, um, health, he, he's a healthy individual and he was released back into the wild. Pero he must be traumatized and will not approach, approach mist nets anymore. So that's uh, one the most recent report on this species in the Philippines. For binturong, so if you already watched a previous talk in this seminar series by Agath de Bruil, um, you will know more about the binturong. So I will just uh, go over it quickly. Actually, so this occurs in South and Southeast Asia. And if you may remember, if you attended uh, Zo or, or if you read about it, it used to be the Philippine or the Palawan binturong used to be Arctictis binturong subspecies with A. But a recent paper that we did with Dr. Veron of the Museum of Natural History in France, uh, we found out that it's not a separate subspecies. It's likely just a member of the Arctictis binturong species. So, hindi na, unfortunately, hindi na valid yung uh, Palawan binturong subspecies. So, it's just Arctictis binturong. And some recent studies, so there is one that was discussed by Agath. You can watch this lecture on the YouTube page of the museum, the UPLB Museum of Natural History. So, they talked about how to improve detection rate through arboreal camera trapping of binturongs. Uh, there is also a thesis that we're preparing for publication from my undergraduate student, Micah, and we found that the dominant fig species for a particular uh, group of binturongs in Aberlan, the uh, dominant food species is figs, or the, so the genus Ficus, and which is actually true for other populations of the binturong, like in Borneo. Figs are also the dominant uh, group in their diet. And then, of course, the Arctic Binturong Foundation has ongoing studies in Palawan on the Binturong. So if you want to be updated, you, you may want to follow their Facebook page or their YouTube page if you want to learn more about their activities in conserving the Binturong in Palawan and other parts of the world. So the Sumba, Sunda Leopard Cat, I don't know if favorite but I favorite. Ko siya. <laughs> and because this occurs in Sundaic Southeast Asia, and you may remember that they might they used to be called Bengalensis, Plurionilus Bengalensis. But Kitchener et al. and so Kitchener and other members of the feline uh, group of IUCN have revised the taxonomy of the Felidae and split 
Korean Islands Bengalensis into two species. One species is the mainland Asian species, so it remains as Prianylurus bengalensis. And through morphological and molecular studies that they collated, they judged that the Prianylurus javanensis of Sundaic, Southeast Asia, should now be diff a different subspecies, or rather, sorry, a different species with two different subspecies. Right now, I'm not yet using the subspecies is uh, Sumatranus and Javanensis Javanensis because I think this requires further study. But I'm in our, one of our recent papers, we already used uh, Javanensis as the new scientific name. And some recent studies, of course, the first to do an in depth study on the leopard cat, specifically the Visayan leopard cat, is Lorica and Oliver. So, Dr. Rene Lorica, okay, discussed in this paper, their current distribution and the habitat utilization. So uh, it used to occur in all over Western Visayas, but there are now islands where they may have been extirpated or where they are no longer present. So Gimaras, they may no longer be present in Gimaras, despite them, that island being in the middle of two islands that still harbor Visayan leopard cat, so Panay and Degros. So it's like very likely no siya sa Gimaras. It used to be that the in this report that they didn't find um, active signs in Masbate, but there are now recent reports from Masbate uh, DNR that uh, they are there. But unfortunately, this report is from them being intercepted uh, from hunting. So they are there, but they're also being actively hunted. And another study was by myself and my advisor, Dr. Digia, and we found that their diet is dominated by rodents. There's also another uh, unpublished study by, um, I think, La Salba Colod, students from La Salba Colod, that also found that they are dominant, dominated by rodents in their diet and specifically non-native rodents. And this is further expounded in the paper by Lorica and Heaney, in which they recorded a breeding population in a sugarcane farm, and also that they prey on non-native rodents. So they are actually beneficial to the sugarcane farms. When I was there conducting my thesis, uh, I would ask people, parang, Ano po kinakain ng maral? Kasi they, they are called maral in the area. So ano po kinakain ng maral? And a lot of them thought that they eat sugarcane kasi they are found in sugarcane fields. But they actually eat the rats that are destroying the sugarcane. So they are actually pest control agents in sugarcane farms. And... Uh, another project I'd like to highlight was the Palawan Leopard Cat Project. So this was a project we did for our MS thesis for myself and my friend, Dr. Caroline Lo. Uh, and this is the first end of study on the leopard cat in Palawan Island. And we did cage trapping, radio tracking, diet analysis, and disease survey. So this is one of the traps that we used. So because this is in Palawan, we had to transport the traps from Los Paños to Palawan and we had to make a solution because usually ang traps ay metal yung bars niya. So we had to make a solution to make them foldable. So this is actually a folding cage that we assembled on site. So it's made of plastic wire para rin hindi masugatan sila when they try to uh, escape or rub on the walls of the cage. And then in the back there, you may see a box, a cardboard box. So this box actually contains uh, chicks, so mga sisiu. And of course, we covered it with plastic para hindi sila mabasa. And we replace their food and water every day. And they are separate from the cage so that they can see it from the opening of the cage, but they get, get to the bait itself. So no chickens were harmed during the study. But eventually, naging manok sila, and eventually they became food for the researchers. <laughs> so, ayun. so eventually, naging manok sila, and um, they were delicious. Thank you very much for your sacrifice for this research. And so, the first animal we captured in this research was not the leopard cat. 
if you have been paying attention, you would know what this animal is a common palm civet. Okay, so that's okay lang naman. So first capture palm civet, not bad. That's still a uh, distribution record. So okay, good. Next that we captured is this guy. So you may have not seen this before. And actually, kahit yung mga guides namin dun sa area, we're saying na this is a baby binturong. So ano to, baby naman to uh, But this is actually a collared mongoose. So there are not a lot of records actually of the collared mongoose. So this is a good distribution record for the collared mongoose. So yay, that's great. But still, not a leopard cat. Next, common palm civet alit. Okay, good. Not a leopard cat. And then yung fourth na nahuli namin was this guy. <laughs> Nasa loob siya ng cage. It's a Philippine toad. And at this point, nag-iisip na ako ng bagong thesis topic. <laughs> so, nakahuli ka with the Philippine toad. Okay, sige. Tuloy pa natin yung trapping. At this point, I think we were three weeks to a month into trapping. And then finally, our fifth capture was this guy. A wonderful Sunda Leopard cat. Okay, so we examined him and we colored him as well as another female. We actually uh, captured four leopard cats in total, but we only colored two because the other two had health issues. And of course, we only want to color um, healthy individuals. So hindi sila masyadong mababother with the color. And we released them in uh, back into their site of capture. So let's try to play this video. Okay, so and this is a leopard cat, and this is the cage slowly being opened. And off he goes. Okay. And, and then we track them using a radio signal receiver. So you can see here, this is the frequency of the particular color. And this is the signal strength. And we uh, increased yung, um, what do you call this? Yung getting the signal using this antenna. So in the forest, nagagaganun kami for four months. So Two months ng dry season and then two months ng wet season. And then we also did a uh, capture of their prey animals. So we also did uh, abundant studies on yung rodents and small mammals in the area. Okay, and this is our results. So this is already published in, a, um, in our paper with Silvatrop in 2018. And we looked at yung home range and habitat utilization. So you can see here the female is occupying more forested areas, uh, possibly simply because that this is the area where uh, we found her. So this is the area where we returned her and this is her home range, 95%. And then this is your 50% home range. Then for the male, you can see that he goes into uh, built up areas, some coconut plantations, mixed brushland. And they actually occupied mostly forest but they are also adaptable to human disturbed habitats. Just like the Visaya leopard cat that goes into sugarcane farms, they can go into mixed brushland. Uh, some mixed brushland also have small farms and coconut plantations and built up areas. So this can also cause a problem in um, human wildlife conflict because they can eat the chickens that they find in their area. So, ang nire-recommend na lang natin namin is paggabi put the chickens in a cage. But of course, not everyone can uh, are, is able to do that. So, we're still, um, we're, we're going to go back to the area. I have a proj another project planned for this. And we're going to look into more solutions to mitigate the human-wildlife conflict between leopard cats and the humans in this area. And another study with, we did by, this is by Dr. Law. Uh, we recently published this in the Journal of Parasitical, Journal of 
parasitical, pas parasitological studies. And this is uh, the diet parasites and other pathogens of leopard cats. And their diet consists mostly, as expected, of rats. So mostly the Palawan spiny rats, si Maxomis, which you saw in the picture earlier, and also non-native rats such as Excellent Stanizumi and Mus musculus. They also eat squirrels and they also eat uh, the tree shrew and a bird that we were not able to identify. And these are some of the parasites that we were able to identify from their feces. And the modes of transmission that could be possible for these parasites is that they could get them from the environment. So some of them are soil or waterborne parasites. And some of them, most of them actually could be from their diet of rats. So the parasites could come from the rats, they would eat them and they would uh, ingest the parasites with them. And there are also domestic animals like cats and dogs in the area. So they may come in contact with them either directly or through environmental contact from the feces that they deposited wherever they're going. So uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can read our paper on uh, JPD. Okay, so now for the collared mongoose. The collared mongoose is now Urva semitorquata. This specific species occurs in Borneo, Sumatra, and now Palawan, and it looks like this. <laughs> and in 2015, I was lucky enough to be co-author in this paper that determined that the individuals from Palawan, they used to be identified as short-tailed mongooses. So short-tailed mongooses, from the name itself, short talaga yung tail nila, about only less than nine inches. But you can see from this picture that Actually, mahaba yung tail nila. But of course, morphology nowadays is not enough to establish um, the taxonomy. So they, we also looked at the molecular aspect and found that they are not short-tailed mongoose, Herpestus brachiurus, but are actually colored mongooses of Herva semitorquata species. And this is actually a blind spot in our research right now because there are no in-depth studies yet apart from distribution records that I have already mentioned before. So uh, records from us and from Marler and from Esselstyn. Apart from that, nothing is known about their diet, ecology, diseases. So this could actually be another future direction for research in carnivoran studies. So if there are uh, students interested, uh, you might want to focus on this because no one has done studies on color, the colored mongoose. So another species is the Palawan stink badger. So from the common name itself, you know that it is an animal that produces a very strong and distinct odor. So meron silang glands and their anal region. But actually, they are closely related to, stonks, to skunks. So if you can imagine how skunks release their uh, odor, it's similar to that of the stink badger. So this species occur through, uh, occurs in South and Southeast Asia for uh, the stink badger itself, but of course the Palawan stink badger is only for Palawan. And there are not many studies in the Philippines. Some recent reports are from Crook, so notes on the status and foraging. And Whitman and Whitman did notes on ecology and conservation. There is a zooarchaeological zoo, zoo evidence of their occurrence in Palawan during the early Holocene. And there is currently an ongoing study by uh, one of our MS Wildlife students, C. Deolito Bicoa, who is doing a study on this species. So again, not a lot of species uh, studies on this species. So that's maybe another study that some students can get it too if you'd like. For the Asian small clawed otter, so this occurs in South and Southeast Asia. And there are actually many recent studies on the small clawed otter. So there is Kanoi et al from 2004. They study the distribution and biology of the species in Southern Palawan. Castro and De La Rosa, uh, the, conservation stat the conservation status in Palawan. So. Mamlaika Castro is actually our uh, leading author specialist in the Philippines, and she is currently a PhD student at our institute. And her student, 
uh, Jeric Gonzalez this studied their distribution and trade for his uh, undergraduate studies. And another undergraduate student, uh, Simon Hildawa from ABD, also studied uh, otters and found that their diet consists mostly of crustaceans and fish, including this lovely species in Sulamon that is purple and orange. And uh, the ongoing PhD study of a uh, doc uh, future doctor, like Al Castro, uh, is on also on Palawan, uh, also on Asian small clawed otters in Palawan. So uh, very exciting things happening. And for one that I've participated in myself, so we are preparing myself and my undergrad with advice, Gavi Corquera, a habitat suitability model for the these authors in Palawan province. So in the current climate model, we can see that most of their distribution predicted habitat, su suitable habitats is in Southern Palawan and somewhere in North Central Palawan. And in the future, you can see here orange and then more reddish in the future climate scenario. So with increasing precipitation, you can also predict that the sizes and number of rivers and waterways will increase. So that will make more suitable habitats for otters. But of course, this model only uh, includes climatic factors. It doesn't include um, other factors such as anthropogenic disturbance or land use change. So that can still jeopardize the future habitat suitability for otters. So we're still working on this because we want to get more data in more areas of Palawan. And finally, our last possible eighth uh, and almost confirmed that on a new species occurring in the Philippines is a smooth-coated otter. So this occurs in South and Southeast Asia. And last year, there was a report that this was the species may be found in Taganak Island, Tawi-Tawi. And the latest news actually says that they have already produced three pups in the island. And right now, there's an ongoing observation by the municipal government of Taganak. And the Taganak Island is in the Turtle Islands Wildlife Sanctuary. So this study is also being done by the Turtle Island Wildlife Sanctuary staff and other collaborators. So yeah, so there are seven species of carnivores in the Philippines, but now they, we may already have eight species due to this new di distribution record. So what are the future directions in the study of carnivores in the Philippines? One that we, we might want to look at is disease research. So as wildlife biologists, we um, handle and um, capture wildlife, but we don't often look at their diseases or take samples for possible disease research. research. But this is now changing, especially with now the famous study that's being conducted by our uh, one of the MNH curators, the doctor, uh, C. Sir Philip Alviola. So, Disease research is now one of the future directions that we could look at in studying carnivores. So they are carriers of viruses and parasites. And actually, one of the theories for the transmission of the first SARS uh, virus, the first SARS epidemic, uh, one of the intermediate hosts, uh, the theory is that it's a uh, civet. So this could also happen again, and this could also happen in the Philippines. So it's important that we monitor the emergence of zoonotic diseases even before they happen so that we are prepared. Another one, another future direction is GPS tracking. So we are already going to do this in the CIVET project in Mount Makiling. And I also have a project that just received approval from the PAMBI of Puerto Princesa Underground River that will also do GPS tracking. So this is more accurate versus radio tracking only because the way that radio tracking works is that you need three signals from three different areas in order to make a triangulation. And that takes a lot of effort. In GPS tracking, first, it only gives you one point that 
is more accurate than triangulation. And also it's more efficient because some GPS tracking collars or uh, tags can also automate data sending. So the one they're using automate, automatically sends me the location of the animal every hour through a mobile app. It sends it to my phone. So that's actually a very efficient way of doing tracking now versus just radio tracking. Another study that we could do in the future is camera trapping. So camera trapping has an automated trigger. So whether it's infrared or motion sensors, so it automatically captures a photo when something moves or a warm object passes by. And this is remotely sent. So you just have to install the camera trap. Siyempre, pwede mo siyang ipabantay para hindi siya manakaw. Or uh, very securely put it with a lock on the tree. And um, so it's very efficient because you can put a lot of camera traps and then they would all automatically record the data. But unfortunately, the problem with camera trapping is right now, camera traps, the good ones at least, are very expensive. So for if you want to do camera trapping, you need a lot of funding for it. So uh, you na kayo ng funding agencies that will help you buy camera traps if you want to do this kind of study. Marami namang available dyan na grants. And also, the great thing about this, as I mentioned, most of our carnivorans are nocturnal and camera traps can actually capture photographs in darkness. So this will help us study them more because they are nocturnal and they can be photographed at night using camera trapping. And another future uh, possible study is modeling, uh, studies in modeling and machine learning. So you could do habitat suitability modeling. So kanina, I showed you yung habitat suitability map that my student did. So actually, this can be done by undergraduate students with data that is already available in databases such as GBIF. So actually, the Animal Biology Division, if you want to follow our Facebook page, uh, that will keep you posted on a future seminar series that we will do on teaching students how to do habitat suitable modeling, as well as other techniques of research that can be done in, your, in the comfort of your own home using data that is already publicly available. So other lectures on ecology and also in um, molecular studies that can be done remotely. So if you're a thesis student that is wary of maybe conducting studies in the field or in the lab, you can um, learn about these modeling techniques that uses uh, publicly available data for your thesis. Another one is environmental niche modeling. So this is a more complex version of habitat suitability modeling that also factors in other uh, factors such as maybe the diet of the individual, the spatial niche, also the temporal niche, to see how they can coexist in the same area. So all of the seven species, except for the new eighth one that I mentioned, they all actually occur in Palawan. And if they, they are all a similar medium side species, how do they differ in terms of their diet? Uh, the times that they are active and the areas where they are active, this can be answered by environmental niche modeling. And then finally, if you are a ComSci person or a techie person who is interested in wildlife, you can also look into automated species detection using AI. So yung camera trap will record hundreds to thousands of photos. And often you have to go through those photos as a researcher, as a person. So you scroll through hundreds and hundreds of these pictures that are mostly leaves moving. <laughs> and in other countries, they have actually started to use AI to automatically detect, for example, tigers. So out of thousands and thousands of photos, this AI can detect if this photo has a tiger. And minsan kahit pisingi lang ng tiger, nade-detect niya that this photo has a tiger in it. So it uses machine learning or AI to automate that process. And also, uh, I think one of the most important studies that we should do, and we are actually talking about this particularly for leopard cats with uh, Kuya Emerson C, who is one of our specialists in wildlife trafficking. So they are still actively being sold 
and traded. And in particular, nauso ngayon ang Facebook. So here is an example of a wildlife trafficker who is selling leopard cat kittens. Sabi niya pa, may pair available at may on the hand siya na pair, pero may three pairs pa siya na pwedeng makuha na available. So this is a growing problem in our um, fight against uh, extinction. So if you find one of these posts, say you, you are a pet hobbyist uh, who follows uh, exotic animal groups like this, if you already know from this lecture that you have learned that this is what the leopard cat looks like, this is what the civet looks like, and it's illegal to trade them without a wildlife farm permit, um, you can report this to your local DNR, okay, or DNRB or the DNR BMB Facebook page. I can't guarantee that they will um, address this as promptly up, as promptly as you'd like, but it's good to have them give them a record of this activity. So that I think that is the end of my lecture, and I would like to entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. All right. Um, paming salamat, Ma'am Des, for that uh, comprehensive. An ano pala? Eight na pala, no? Oh my God, ito. Uh, <laughs> ah, akala, ko, akala ko eight hours na tayo. Hindi, hindi. Eight species. Eight, eight species. species. Actually, binabasa ko nga yun yung, si, yung authors, yung mm -hmm. smooth, uh, smooth coated authors from, mm -hmm. uh, from Saba. From Saba. I th it's I, possible that they came from Borneo or Saba. From Borneo, okay. So it, sila sa tawi -tawi. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're inviting everyone to uh, ask question from kay Mam Des Fernandez. Uh, yun, uh, oh, marami na agad. So, siguro, ano lang, para slow lang tayo. <laughs> okay, ako muna, ako muna magtatanong. So, um, yun nga, 2020, may smooth colored... Um, Authors na na-observe sa Tawi-Tawi, probably it came from Saba or basta napadpad sila doon. Nag-swim yata sila, dalwa lang muna sila, baka mag-asawa. So given that na six na sila and possibly they will be uh, growing as a family, di ba? would you say that uh, there's a big possibility na uh, mag-establish sila ng local population uh, in the southern portion of uh, the Philippines in the Near future, let's say five, five to ten years. Yeah, I definitely think it's possible, mm -hmm. and it's not unlikely that this has happened before. Hindi lang siya napansin. Mm -hmm. So, since nakagawa na sila ng three pups, they could grow it e even more, and it's really important for the local community. I think very willing naman sila to protect the species, mm -hmm. yung municipal government, and also yung PA. Uh, PA staff ng uh, Turtle Islands. So it's very possible that they could establish a good population in that island. Mm -hmm. uh, interested lang ako kasi hindi ko, ka, ko ma-imagine ano yung tsura ng ano, do they do they have nests or burrows? Or... Nag, nag de may den sila. So ah, para, den. para siyang ano, uh, naghuhukay sila. Pero in immediately malapit sa shoreline ba siya or mm -hmm. do they have to go up upstream ganon? I, I wouldn't say like sa shoreline it uh -oh. They go a little further ng konti para hindi mababaha consistently yung den mm -hmm. nila. So in an area na hindi laging nababaha ng tubig. So they make a den. Tapos dun sila nag-hunt sa ocean for crustaceans or fish mm -hmm. ganun. Tapos iuuwi nila sa pups nila. Mm -hmm. Itong diet pala ng smooth-coated smooth otters are mainly fish. no Compared mm -hmm. dun sa otters natin na Yun nga, crustaceans daw ang masan diet nila. Anyway, okay. So, uh, we have Francis Requenco, si Francis ng Cavsu. Uh, okay. Ang, ask, ang question niya is, uh, for the disease monitoring, how much po ng biological samples ang pwedeng i-collect uh, hmm. para safe na rin sa mga animals? So, of course, hindi naman natin siguro isi-stress pa sila hmm. lalo. So, how much in the sense na ano yung mga biological samples na kailangan do 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 you need blood tissues or mm -hmm. extracts byproducts so yun po ang tanong niya mm -hmm. so it depends on what you want to look at for us yung sa parasites 
fecal samples yun. For some of them are environmental. So, napupulot lang namin sa transit. So, usually, nilalagay namin sa GP namin is 30 fecal samples per transect. Okay na yun. And then, for blood, uh, since medium-sized mammals naman sila, for the bigger ones like civet, leopard cat, binturong, up to 1 ml is okay to collect. 1 ml of blood. Pero for the smaller ones, like si Stink Badger siguro, I would recommend baka 0.5 ml lang yung itake nyo. The problem rin with, uh, from our experience in studying uh, diseases from blood ng civet and ng leopard cat is mabilis si mag-coagulate yung blood nila. So sometimes, ang nakokollect lang namin actually is 0.5 ml even if our target is 1 ml and if even if it's okay to collect 1 ml. So ang ginagawa na lang namin is sometimes for per- leopard cats in particular since they are very closely related to cats and already actually in zoo practice because I used to be uh, I used to work in a zoo it's common practice to you can use yung parang test kit alam niyo yung art yung ano parang rapid test kit ng pregnancy test o kaya mm-hmm. i think ngayon ang ang covid ay may rapid test kit na lang you just put a drop of blood so kahit one drop lang you it will tell you if it is positive or negative for a certain disease but of course that's only um i that's only recommended for yung leopard cats that are in the same family as your domestic cat. Kasi these kits are designed for domestic animals. So, wala pa tayo masyadong kits that are designed for carnivores. What you could also do is you could also take, you could still take blood spot, blood spot samples pero run them through RT-PCR or uh, other other PCR methods that in that way you could detect other uh, other um, diseases that you might not have kits for or hindi recommended yung kits for. So, yun. So, Uh, one ml of blood, ang usually nilalagay namin sa permit namin and pinapayagan naman kami usually ng one ml kasi malaki naman sila na animals. But for the smaller species, maybe 0.5 lang. Okay. So, I hope that answers your question, Frances. Okay. Um, questions from Willem Joshua Tan. Uh, ito, ito, no, tatlo ito. No? Pero yung first ay, if the civet cats uh, don't normally eat coffee as per your observation, uh, how is there even a product mm-hmm. of coffee you know, produced by a civet? Siguro rhetorical question ito, pero mm-hmm. yun. Yeah. So our study na wala silang kinakain na coffee at that particular time is in Mount Makiling. So Mount Makiling kasi is very diverse in the fruit-bearing trees. And kahit hindi fruit-bearing trees, lahat ng klaseng trees, uh, matas yung biodiversity sa Ma- Mount Makiling. And sometimes civets can also go into areas where there's lower biodiversity. An example of this is coffee farm. So if you have civets that are going into coffee farms, malamang in that area, ang makakain lang nila is coffee. And the reason actually why coffee luwak or kape alamid is one of the most expensive coffees in the world is that the animals themselves pick the best or the most ripe, almost overripe na, na coffee berries. They eat them and then the seeds are intact. So these are the best coffee fruits that they pick. But unfortunately, ang nangyayari dito in some countries, I, would, I don't know if it occurs here in the Philippines, is that ang ginagawa nila, naguhuli sila ng civet, pinapakain nila ng coffee, and then yung poop yung ginagawa nilang coffee. So that, of course, is not the most, uh, the most ethical way of getting this coffee. Tapos tataasan mo yung price because, simply because it's civet coffee, when in fact these are captive captive individuals na pinapakain mo lang ng coffee. So, uh, yes, they can produce the coffee uh, poop in the wild if they occur in areas where there are coffee farms or a lot of coffee and not, not no other um, better alternatives like walang saging matching, walang ficus, or one of, wala nung other stuff that they prefer or love more. They can produce coffee, pero there are also people who take advantage of that and market it into making money for their own advantage, unfortunately. Yes, incidentally, uh, marami na mga, mga civets ang nire-rear ngayon sa ano, 
mga battery cages just like mm-hmm. you know chicken so pinapakain talaga sila ng, ng coffee as part of their diet so that when they when they uh, excrete yung kanilang uh, feces uh, yun nga pwede na nilang i-collect yung uh, civet processed na, na na beans so that's um, medyo ano naman na konti yun medyo uh, lagpas na sa ating ating uh, tawag ito Uh, pagdating sa animal welfare ay hindi na masyadong mm-hmm. sumusunod. Okay. Yeah. So yung may, next, yeah. May comment si Ma'am Jude, tam yes, oh, ginagawa na sa Pilipinas yung pagpapakain ng kape sa civet. I tr- really Ma'am Jude. So yeah. <laughs> pwede ba nating is- <laughs> <laughs> wag na <laughs> squeal. <laughs> squeal. So, actually if gusto, if gusto niyo tal- I don't recommend buying coffee luwak, pero kung gusto niyo talaga mm-hmm. Um, try to background check the company kung pwede na meron namang companies na wild gathered so kunyari may coffee farm sila may natural occurring civets doon tapos pinupulot lang nila yung uh, pinupulot lang nila yung poop but of course wala namang regulatory body telling you na totoo yung sinasabi nila na wild gathered yun so Yeah, you can never be sure. Yeah. Kaya ang pinaka na talaga that you have to trace it back to the source kasi mm-hmm. sometimes uh yung nga sasabi lang nila it's uh, organically grown, it's uh processed Wild using gathered. yes, mga ganun. Uh pero of course uh sa marketing kasi when there's demand and then you cannot supply the demand, uh sometimes the producers the result to uh resort to other means para ma 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 fulfill yung 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 product no so doon tayo minsan nagkaka problema mm-hmm. okay uh second question by Willem um uh, if the cats were are said to be oh no no sorry if the civets were said to be introduced in the Philippines uh are there any impacts uh to native wildlife probably back then when they were mm-hmm. uh starting to establish themselves Uh, it's it's hard to tell definitively if there was an impact but definitely for any species that is not native to an area kahit yung mga invasive species natin ngayon you mm-hmm. may have an impact on the area pero it seems like they were since they were naturalized and hindi naman sila naging overwhelmingly marami unlike mm-hmm. say kunyari yung Rhinella marina which is an overwhelming problem Uh, and our non-native rodents, uh, it looks like the impact seems to have been minimal. But as of course, you can't tell unless you look at maybe zooarchaeological records or previous records of how uh, they impacted yeah. when they came into new islands of the Philippines. Yeah. Uh, parang ano lang. It's like... A... Walang established na studies eh no or mm-hmm. back then wala naman nagawa yon hindi tulad ngayon i think uh, i think in the past few years may mga studies na uh, uh, directly correlating uh, the yung bird pop was it bird population and yung feral cats i mm-hmm. think mm-hmm. there are states or countries na meron ng sinasabi nila meron mga populations ng certain birds na nababawasan talaga because of feral cats. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think sa atin ay wala pang mga ganong studies. Na. Mm-hmm. Pero I think it's important already for students and young researchers, kahit old researchers, mm-hmm. to already do long-term population sampling. Kasi kulang sa atin sa Pilipinas yung long-term mm-hmm. na monitoring ng mga, any species actually. So that's something you can look into in order to prove definitively if this species has an impact in this area. I think ang may long-term lang, maybe rodents, syempre kasi they are economically destructive. Kaya meron silang long-term studies. But for our other, um, for our other, uh, other wildlife, walang masyadong population studies. Mm-hmm. So sabi ni Ma'am Leti, si Doc M, meron siyang study on feral cats and how they affect Kalayan rails. So if you want ah, to, I see. Yeah, if you want to read that, uh, you can look up that paper in Silvatrop also. Oh, thank you Ma'am Leti and of course Ma'am Doc M. Okay, uh, yung uh, third question ni uh, Willem, uh katakala siya. Why does the Philippine uh, why does it have no large carnivores? 
Actually, there is evidence that we used to have tigers in Palawan. Mm-hmm. So sa Borneo, meron silang tigers and the fauna of Borneo and Palawan are actually very similar. So it's not unlikely that we used to have tigers way back in I don't know which period, pero this is zoolo- archaeological evidence already. Mm-hmm. So wala na sila sa Palawan, but we did used to have tigers in Palawan, but unfortunately they or uh, they became extirpated from the area. Um, you can read that paper if you want to know more about their theories about how they think the tigers became extinct. But of mm-hmm. course, no definitive answer yet about how they did become extinct in Palawan. But they oh. were tigers noon. Oo nga, no? maganda sana kung may mahukay na just like yung, uh, yung rhino, rhino na nahukay sa Kalinga, di ba? There's an evidence that, you know, the early, our early ancestors, mm-hmm. prehistoric uh, Filipinos, uh, part ng diet nila, kinakain nila. Pero of course, wala pa tayong nakikita na evidence na kinain din ng Pilipino yun no? in, in, way back in the past. Mm-hmm. So a uh, question from Charmeline Ruth Castillo Vicente. Um, can the rodent eating civet be domestically kept, uh, especially in areas that are uh, rodent infested? Uh, what are your opinions on that? I think what they're referring to is si leopard cat. Sila yung um, rodent, primarily rodent eating. Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, uh, you might catch them siguro pag kitten pa, na maliliit pa yung ngipin nila so hindi ka pa nila masyado makakagat. Pero mm-hmm. eventually, when they grow into adults, definitely they are not able, you cannot tame them. Uh, unlike, say, those that are already hybridized. Merong, uh, merong breed of cat, yung Bengal cat, which is a some very far generation, like eight generations or 16 generations na crossed initially with leopard cat and then crossed and crossed and crossed with domestic cats. With domestic cats. So pure leopard cats, it's, you cannot keep them as pets. Hindi sila magiging maamo when they grow up. And actually, ang kwento sa akin nung nag-fielder ako sa Palawan is meron ang nakagat sa kanila ng leopard cat and nabasag yung buto niya sa finger because nakagat siya ng leopard cat. So, <laughs> I don't recommend it. it they they may, should may, definitely not be kept. May rabies bang leopard cats? Uh, right leopard now, wala pang evidence na may rabies sila. Pero, uh, it's better to be sure. Pag nag-handle kami, we use yung gloves na makapal. Makapal. Uh, just so, hindi kami makagat. Oh, masakit din yun. <laughs> okay, uh, question from Joaquim de Sena. What are the ecological... Uh, ways or methods to observe or survey uh, carnivora like the leopard cats and civets in the wild. Maybe siguro i-recap muna lagi diniscuss mo kanina. Yeah. So recap, there are many ways of studying them. Uh, the least invasive way is to use camera traps. Is set mo lang yung camera and anything that moves in front of it or anything na may heat in front of it na it will take a picture. So it can take a picture in, day- in daylight and then at night time. Uh, you can also uh, use cage traps. Uh, you can also uh, look at their poop. So, pupulot, pupulotin mo lang yung poop. Another way, actually, that you can uh, look at uh, populations is DNA sampling through poop. So, you can see through DNA, uh, for, for, through molecular methods, yung poop na yon, ano ang saan siya galing or anong animal siya nang galing specifically. So for Mount Makiling, obvious naman kung ano itsura ng, uh, ang tawag dito, ano itsura ng civet poop. So when we see a civet poop, we immediately know that it's a civet poop. Mm. Pero syempre, for, uh, just to be sure, it's better actually to use molecular methods. But it doesn't matter which ecological way of observing or surveying uh, carnivora, kahit spotlighting lang yan, kahit magtitingin ka lang uh, in the forest. What you need actually first is a permit. <laughs> So before you do any of these things, you need a permit from, uh, you need either a GP or kung protected area, kailangan mo ng pambi clearance and then GP. If you're working on in Makiling, you need to get a permit from the uh, MCME, which manages Mount Makiling. So sila yung magbibigay ng permit sa inyo. Definitely, you cannot start, start any study in Mount Makiling, whether it's on this side or the other side of Mount Makiling, you need to get a permit from MCME. And also... Uh, there are other ways. Uh, of course, there are other permits that you have to do. Ayakok, uh, you have. You need to get uh, uh, 
permit from your institutional animal use and care committee mm -hmm. if you have one if you don't have one you can apply dito sa UPLB they can also give you a permit so if your school doesn't have an ayako committee pwede kayo mag-apply ng ayako permit dito kahit hindi kayo taga UP uh, and you also after that need yung permit sa Bureau of Animal Industry to handle animals specifically i think hindi na, i think lahat kailangan ng bai after ng ayako pero this is specifically important if you're doing disease studies na ide directly handle and manipulate mo yung animal okay okay so i hope na yung rundown na yun ay is <laughs> maka ma, makatulong sa iyo Kim and uh, next question uh, another follow up question are the yung leopard cats ba are they susceptible to diseases mm -hmm. that are that can be found from the domestic cats. Yes, definitely. That's why that's one of the things that we studied. Because uh, they are highly susceptible to, dis do, to diseases from domestic cats Because mm. since they are so closely related. And actually, diseases can still make a jump kahit from cats, kahit from civets to humans. So it's important to study it either way. So yes, the answer is yes. They are susceptible to diseases from domestic cats. Okay, um, question from Ms. Marlin Rosakdalad. Um, how can she reach you? <laughs> if ever na may mga questions or mga inquiries in the future, probably you could... Uh, okay. Is it okay I... to broadcast your email address? Yeah, okay lang. Uh, you can find my professional email address naman in the website of the Animal Biology Division. But I will type it here na lang sa chat for everyone's mm. convenience. So this is my email address, dpfernandez1 at up.edu.ph. That is my professional email address. And so if you have... Uh, technical questions or professional questions, uh, you can uh, message me there. Okay, so nilagay ko sa chat box. It's mm -hmm. dpfernandez1 at up.edu.ph. So um, uh, another question from Joaquim in Negros. Uh, he heard that uh, leopard cats eat fruits. Mm -mm. So is it true? Uh, that's actually a common misconception pag in any carnivore uh, usually pag nakikita sila sa area na may fruit people think na they eat fruit but specifically for leopard cats leopard cats are what you call hyper carnivores so they almost don't eat any plant matter at all except if you have a pet cat uh, makikita mo na kumakain sila ng grass so we have actually seen grass, fresh grass in their uh, fecal matter, and this is to help them digest. But we have never seen any other plant matter apart from the grass that they eat for digestion in their fecal samples. Okay, thank you. So another question, at what age do leopard cats mm. reach uh, sexual maturity? How long is their pregnancy and how many kittens do they produce? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll have to, uh, I don't have it in my current active mm -hmm. memory right now, how many months and yung, ano, yung kanila sexual maturity and pregnancy. Um, but I used to uh, be an intern at, uh, in uh, Negros, there is a wildlife rescue center doon yung Negros Forest Ecological Foundation. Basta yung Negros Biodiversity Conservation Center, basta katabi siya ng capital sa Bacolod, I highly recommend visiting that visiting that rescue center if it's open. I think currently it's being managed by a very good NGO called Talarak Foundation. They are mm -hmm. also, I forgot to mention them, but they are also con currently doing camera trap studies. And in those camera trap studies, although hindi sila focused on leopard cats, they also detect distributions of leopard cats in new areas of Negros. So shout out to Talarak Foundation for doing such good work in Negros. Um, so usually they produce two kittens, one or two kittens. Ang na na nakita ko in my experience, short experience of working with them in a rescue center. So, and actually another future direction na hindi pa masyado na explore is reproductive studies. Mm -hmm. So I think um, if you're interested in doing reproductive studies, if you're a student here in UPLB that wants to do reproductive studies on animals, uh, you can uh, maybe look up si Mamdi from also our colleague from 
ABD. So Ma'am D. Maligalig is uh, one of our uh, specialists in reproductive biology. So actually, matagal niya ako kinukulit <laughs> if, if I want to do studies on reproductive. But of course, it's not in my uh, wheelhouse. But if it is in your wheelhouse and you'd like mm-hmm. to study that, that's uh, also a good uh, study na hindi pa masyado na-explore dito sa Pilipinas. So, uh, from Sir Noel Rafael of Avilon. Yes, okay, so this the question is in, related to your talk, but uh, it's about the Palawan tiger. So, uh, wait, is there an evidence of orangutan in mm. Palawan as well? Um, wala pa akong nababasa, sir, mm. if meron ng evidence of orangutan. But, yeah, I haven't read any of it yet. Pero I will message you if I find any references for that. Okay. So, another question. Um, meron ba mga breeding programs uh, here in the Philippines for, no, not, not, hindi naman lahat siguro ng carnivores na, na, na mention mo, but uh, if there are, uh, saan siya makikita? Mm-mm. Definitely, uh, yung na-mention ka nga yung Talarak Foundation and the Negros Biodiversity uh, Wildlife uh, yung Wildlife Rescue Center doon, they ha- do have a breeding program for mm-hmm. uh, le- Visayan leopard cats. So yung leopard, so the leopard cats in Negros. Uh, it used to be that yung Wildlife Rescue Center sa uh, Mariit, which is in Panay Island sa uh, north of Iloilo, they used to have leopard cats, but the last time I visited, wala na silang leopard cats as of the moment doon. And of course, other Wildlife Rescue Centers may have breeding programs, but uh, you, we, I think wildlife rescue centers are very underfunded and mm-hmm. as much as possible, they try to limit the captive breeding. So for only those for that, for only those that are very urgent in need, urgently in need of conservation, like yung Visayan leopard cat, uh, yun yun talagang active in breeding program. But for the others, I don't uh, see a lot of highly publicized, um, very focused breeding programs on carnivores in particular. Yun lang sa negros. Okay. So a uh, question from Joseph Conrad Sena. Um, uh, he might have missed, uh, you might have mentioned this al- already, but uh, mm. siguro na miss lang niya. Uh, what are the conservation status of each uh, species? And uh, siguro oh, very yeah. briefly, what are the efforts that are being made to address those um, yung conservation status. Yeah, I think hindi ko pala siya na mention but they were on my mm. uh, on my slide so let me share that screen sandali. Okay. So for uh Malay civet and Palawan snake badger they are least concerned right now. So it ang evaluation at IUCN is that they still have a good population but for uh, the Asian small cloud otter and binturong vulnerable na sila. So they're already in a threatened category. Tapos these other ones, si colored mongoose and the leopard cat and common palm civet, since bago yung taxonomy nila and bago yung designation nila na species, currently wala pa silang uh, IUCN, uh, wala, wala pa silang IUCN threat category. But yung nominate species nila like si um, hermaphroditos, bengalensis, and yung colored mongoose throughout Southeast Asia, I think least concern sila. Although yung former subspecies na prionylus bengalensis robore, yung Visayan leopard cat in particular, was categorized as vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Uh, for myself, working with the Asian Wildcat Network, our prediction currently is that they also might be categorized as vulnerable. Yung mainland leopard cat, it seems like marami pa sila and okay pa yung population nila but highly threatened yung I, yung Sunda leopard cat because they occur in small islands that are highly populated and although adaptable sila, so maybe hindi sila maybe hindi sila endangered but they are vulnerable I think because mm-hmm. of anthropogenic factors. Okay. So related to that, uh, si Joaquim Desena is the siguro tanong like ka-clarify lang siguro is the Visayan leopard cat uh, scientific name still considered uh, Prionyl sorry, Bengalene Bengalensis raborai or Prionyl rulus, sorry ah, uh, Javanensis. Ah, <laughs> uh, para lang mas madaling maintindihan, uh, Prionyl rulus. Ailurus means cat. 
Prion okay. means uh, means parang primitive. So primitive cat, prion nailurus. Prion, prion nailurus. Uh, Bulul talaga ako. Okay. <laughs> kahit ako na bubulul ako kahit I've been studying them for 10 years. So, <laughs> so si prion nailurus bengalensis robora currently is no longer a valid scientific or rather subspecies name for the Visayan leopard cat in particular. Ang um, accepted ng IUCN and the IUCN feline cat, uh, cat working group is si Prionylurus javanensis, specifically yung Sumatranus na subspecies sa atin. Yung javanensis javanensis is I think for the island of Java, if I'm not mistaken. Pero I am a little hesitant to use um, the subspecies javanensis sumatranus. Kasi wala pang masyadong in-depth studies for these individual islands. I would like to wait for more studies on that before I start using Prionylus Jamvanensis Sumatranus. But definitely, hindi na tayo Bengalensis. Our leopard cats mm-hmm. are now proudly their own species, Prionylus Jamvanensis. Okay. So, uh, mm-hmm. okay, from Cyrus de la Cruz, uh, may recent study po ba kayo ng leopard cat population sa Masbati Island? Hi Cyrus, uh, the answer is no, but I would really love to go to Masbate Island to study the leopard cats there. Kasi nga, may recent report from the ENR that they are still occurring in the area. Um, of course, hindi tayo 100% sure if they were trafficked maybe from Negos, tas nilipat sa Masbate, and so on and so forth. But it's an interesting record if may nahanap siya sa Masbate in a local area. If we could set up camera traps, I think if you want to do this, Cyrus, mm-hmm. or if you know a friend who wants to do this and who wants to collaborate, if you're already in the area, that's great. Kasi ngayon ang hirap na may COVID. So marami tayong restrictions on travel. So it's very difficult to travel right now. But if you want to do it, I am willing to uh, help you or help you plan for this research if that's something you want to do. But I myself also want to do it actually. Okay. Uh, so, kung Cyrus ko nasa Masbate ka ngayon, pwede mo nang gawin yan ngayon. Uh, so, so uh, from... Oh, nandiyan daw siya. Uh, actually, they are considered pests sa mga poultry mm-hmm. as per interview interview po. Pero of course, uh, Cyrus, uh, just a word of caution lang, wag natin uh, i-generalize din agad. Alam mo naman kasi ngayon ang mga balita, di ba? Uh, dahil naging uso lang si leopard cat, ang tingin din ng karamihan ay it could be you know, the, the whole print. So uh, especially kung interviews lang siya, just make sure na yung, nga, uh, yung information na yun ay well established by uh, occurrences uh, at saka yung mga records. Hmm. But I am definitely not surprised if they are also considered pets. Uh, pests. Mm. Pest, or, or, pet, or pets. Either way. Uh, if they're con- also considered pests. Kasi ganun din sa Palawan na ang, actually ang kwento dyan is uh, they only eat yung heads ng chicken. Ah, oh, talaga? Siniiwan nila yung katawan. <laughs> um, Sayang kaya, naman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised that they eat if they eat chickens in the area. And that's also a common problem all around the world according to the our our presentations at the Asian Wildcat Network na mabuti nga manok lang eh kasi mm-hmm. ang ibang problema ng members ng Asian Wildcat Network ay tao ang pinapatay ng tiger or ng leopard or <laughs> ganun mm-hmm. so actually buti manok lang pero syempre it's still a problem because it gives them a negative negative uh, image kumbaga so it's hard to conserve something that people don't like diba Yun. yes so, true yeah. So from Marlene Sakdalan so um, is it true po ba na yung mongoose they are immune to snake venom I think baka mm. napalo din sa ano sa Jackie Chan movie ano, ano? <laughs> I think I think it's a common story for other species of mongoose pero for the collared mongoose the one we have in the Philippines there are no studies and there are no records that they are immune to snakes mm. but uh, actually, wala nga diet. Eh. Hindi nga natin alam kung ano kinakain nila if kumakain sila ng snakes at all. So, mm-hmm. if you're a student, baka gusto nyo i-study yung kanilang uh, diet. Oo. Naalala ko lang kasi yan kasi eh, parang napanood ko yata yan. Eh. Snake in the eagle shadow yata yan. Wow. <laughs> anyway, okay. So, any more questions from our audience? Uh, ako, pwede ako mag-field ako ng question. Um, sure. Siguro, oh. Among yung future directions na nabanggit mo. So, which among them 
or based on your opinion is more you know important to conservation mm-hmm. hindi natin tinatanggal yung uh, uh, impact nila no yung the other the other direct uh, research directions that you have stated pero sa tingin mo at this point in time which is the most uh, important or most uh, relevant Mm-mm. I think ang pinaka-efficient and effective of the methods I mentioned already is camera trapping. Kasi I've also had an experience with um, uh, internship sa Scotland, sa Scottish Wildcat Project. Mm-hmm. And sa Britain, halos ang buong Britain, meron silang grid na meron silang camera traps. So dun sa grid na yon, you can look at yung camera traps sa buong Britain nasa nag occur itong mga hayop na to mm-hmm. so na, so actually uh, the big big dream is to have a network of camera traps all over the Philippines if it's possible in all our protected areas pero what a dream diba kasi yeah. ang mahal ng camera traps yes. but the kind of information you can get from camera traps is not just pictures so pag meron kang location ng hayop You can tell from that location ano yung altitude, ano yung slope, ano yung cover ng puno, ano yung mga klaseng puno na nahanap doon. And you can, if you have a big enough set of data, you can extrapolate that such that makakamap ka ng nasan yung hotspots na kailangan talaga natin silang i-conserve. You can model yung environmental factors and other bioclimatic natural factors that you can get from camera trap locations. Tapos makikita mo, okay, etong area na to sa PA na to, dito pinaka-likely maraming binturong. So this is the area that we can, cons- we can conserve kung gusto nating i-conserve ang binturong. So actually, I think camera traps would be the most efficient and effective mm-hmm. out of the methods I mentioned right now that can be applied to a large scale with enough funding. <laughs> Yes, yes. So, uh, follow-up question. Uh, so, again, which among the researchable areas that you have mentioned ang currently ano ba, uh, in or highly regarded by our funding agencies uh, here in the Philippines? Mm, I think depende yan sa agency. Pero mm-hmm. uh, I would like to think that our agencies don't look at the area you're researching but at the quality of your proposal. Mm-hmm. So I think it doesn't matter, uh, it matters a little bit, pero mas matingbang yung quality nung paggawa mo ng proposal, how robust your methods are, and if you conducted a good literature, literature search about the previous studies that we have been conducted in your particular species or your particular area, and if you have... M- use standard methods that are backed by evidence na ito yung effective na methods na gamitin for this particular project, mm-hmm. mas matingbang kung gaano ka ganda and gaano ka robust yung proposal mo rather than what species you're studying and where you are studying it. Of course, there are limitations like maybe some funding agencies, for example, we have um, Uh, you used to, we have a project in Samar and the funding agency in the OSD was concerned about the security uh, issue in Samar. So that might be one difficulty that you could face in terms of the area that people propose. Mo. But yes. other than that, I would say mas matimbang yung quality ng proposal rather than where and what you will be studying. Okay, so, so mga future researchers, jam, please take note. Huh? <laughs> okay, uh, any more questions from our group? Before we wrap up, uh, we could still uh, accept a few, one or two questions para kay Ma'am Des so while waiting for our chat box to, to fill. Uh, how about ano, yung studies on uh, bushmeat, Ma'am Des? Mm, yeah. uh, on the side naman siguro ng sa social, you know, sociological aspect or probably mm-hmm. anthropological um Uh, marami na bang studies or may studies ba on you know using the use of uh, uh, meat and meat byproducts from these uh, from these uh, uh, animals and mm-hmm. uh, ano bang effect nito in terms of you know conservation uh, mm-hmm. have you come across at that yeah definitely I I I I've read one study that um discussed yung bushmeat uh, hunting and trade mm. 
Pero yung authors nitong particular study nito, hindi nila ni-reveal kung saan exactly yung study area nila to protect yung kasi mang in-interview nila mga hunters. Mm-hmm. So, but they did say na civet is one of the animals na kinakain. And uh, of course, I can't say um alam ko ang sa Palawan in the particular area that I studied in, they do also eat and hunt uh, leopard cats, but um uh, for some of them who are members of the Tagbanwa tribe Uh, as long as limited and for personal consumption. There are laws that allow them to do this. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. there are also people who don't use them, who are not part of the tribe or who don't use them for uh, personal consumption. They use them to trade. Kunyari. And the danger with bushmeat consumption actually is transmission of diseases. I mentioned before na ang civet ang one of the Uh, parang theorized intermediate host ng previous na SARS. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not as bad as our SARS right now na epidemic, pero this could happen again if people continue to eat bush meat kasi the diseases, the viruses, or whatever could make a jump from these animals that live in the wild and gather wild pathogens. They could make that jump from their environment to humans. Mm, okay. So... Bago ko siguro tapusin yung uh, Q&A sa tanong ni uh, Willem, ang tanong ko ay, ito lang, parang, lang. Na, naging curious lang ako kasi di ba class carnivora sila. No? Mm-hmm. So, uh, does that mean that they were, when they were first observed or described, yung kanilang uh, diets was thought of Uh, meat muna before they were uh, considered as omnivores or frugivores for that matter. Mm-hmm. So, since carnivora yung kanilang class, meron bang ano ba? Ano, may, do, are mm-hmm. they thinking na babaguhin din ba nila yung class? Uh, maganda tong question. <laughs> diba? Wala for... lang. Na. <laughs> Nano lang ako eh. That's true. That's a common uh, question. Especially for our students in ZOO 148. Hello sa inyo. Mm-hmm. So, ang order carnivora, kaya sila tinawag na carnivora kasi yung kanilang common ancestor, yung unang carni- carnivora, ay mm. carnivorous talaga siya. So, malaki yung pangil nila and then yung molars nila ay sharp. Unlike sa atin na flat yung molars natin for chewing, sa kanila it's for cutting meat halos, parang guillotine yung carnations car- carnations nila. So, uh, yung ancestors nila ay carnivorous. And mm-hmm. actually, most members of carnivora do eat meat. Some are omnivor- omnivorous. And then, yung iba, nag-evolve na lang sila na imbis lahat sila ay kakain ng meat. They could occur in the same area, di ba? And some of them, imbis na kumain ng meat, na, marami na kumakain ng meat. Kain naman mm-hmm. tayo ng fruit. Try naman natin to. Baka masarap to. Mm-hmm. Of course, that's True, just diba? a fun way of thinking of it. But it's more complex than that. So, nagkaroon sila ng niche differentiation na si Binturong, okay, si Binturong kumakain naman siya ng fig. So, yung molars niya na sharp for cutting, ngayon naging adapted na siya for cutting yung pulp ng fruit para mas madali niyang ma-digest. Mm-hmm. So, yung skull nila and dentition nila uh, ng mga carnivores ay all, all very similar. So, kaya sila tinawag na carnivora. Yung ancestor nila ay carnivorous. Many of mm-hmm. them are carnivorous, but not all of them are carnivorous. So, kaya I prefer yung term na carnivoran. Kesa, mm-hmm. Although, mm-hmm. In, in the context of mammalogy, when you say carnivore, alam agad na yun ay mammalian of the order carnivora. Pero for most of the public, medyo pag sinabi mong carnivore, bakit carnivore? Mm-hmm. Eh, kumakain naman sila ng fruit. So, yes. I, I prefer the term carnivoran sometimes. Okay, sige. Thank you. So, uh, last question na lang po ito from William Joshua Tan. Um, why does the small clawed otters prefer crustaceans over fish? Or um, did he read it that wrong? So, okay. clarify na lang po before we wrap up. So, the specific study na, um, that I uh, cited for this was an undergraduate thesis by one of our students from ABD, Simon Hildawa. And doon sa specific area where he studied, uh, Aberland River, 
uh, or actually higher, a little bit higher, one of the substreams and all, all across a Borland River. Ang nahanap niya na contents ng poop ng otters is crustaceans. And ang, I think this is because sobrang daming crustaceans din mm-hmm. sa river. I've been to that place and I was there when he was conducting his thesis. And like, mag, if maglagay ka ng bote ng coke, lagyan mo siya ng, buksan mo siya ng isang square, lagyan mo ng kanin sa loob. That's how they catch uh, these small crabs. And then the next day, tuwid, ano lang, overnight lang, pag taas nila ng coke, puno na ng crabs yung laman ng uh, plastic coke bottle. So mm. I think this could be attributed to the sheer number and dami ng crustaceans in that particular river na kanyang uh, tinadi. Pero actually, if you want to study er- other areas of Palawan, I think other areas will also say, uh, other studies will also say na marami rin kasing crustaceans talaga. So, mm-hmm. this, yun yung primary talaga nila na diet all because of abundance. But of course, they also eat fish when they can catch them. Pero, syempre, mas, I think mas mahirap i-catch, uh, I don't know, hindi naman ako otter, no? Pero, <laughs> baka mas mahirap i-catch yung fish. Or, there are less fish and talagang marami talagang crustaceans in the area. Uh, diet ability, uh, sabi yung Mamadjo, diet depends uh, on the availability of prey. So, in this particular, yeah, in the, the particular study that I mentioned, in that particular area, sobrang daming crabs. Kaya, maraming crabs din sa kanilang diet. Okay. So, sige, we'll be wrapping up. Uh, Ma'am Dest, maraming salamat for accepting our invitation to be our resource person today and to all our you know, uh, audience, yung ating mga participants, maraming salamat for again, attending our Museum of Natural History Biodiversity Seminar. And bago po tayo magtapos, let us just go into our virtual presentation of the Virtual Certificate of Recognition. Let me just uh, share my screen. So the Museum of Natural History, Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension here at UP Los Banos, awards this uh, certificate of recognition to Professor Desemarie Antoinette P. Fernandez for serving as our resource person during the 2021 MNH Biodiversity Seminar on entitled Cryptic Creatures, Updates on the Study of Philippine Carnivorans held today, April 12th. 2021 from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Philippine Standard Time via Zoom. And in witness whereof, the signature of our director, Dr. Barian P. De Leon, is here unto a fix. So maraming salamat, Ma'am Des. Thank you very much. You received the digital certificate. Yes. Ibibigay ko pa ganyan. Kukunin mo. And just closing last word na siguro. So, mm. ang title nung seminar is Cryptic Creatures. So, ang hindi lang cryptic actually yung creatures. Pati kami na nagsa-study ng carnivores. <laughs> cryptic din kami. Kasi I think mabibilang mo sa dalawang kamay how many of us actually specialize. So, I hope this inspired some of our students and young researchers to go into carnivore research. Kasi para hindi naman kami maging cryptic, dumami naman kami ng konti. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Bam Des. Thank you. And make sure that you uh, answer our online evaluation form. The link was posted in the chat box, but uh, kung mamaya nyo pa sasagutan, just go to bit.ly slash 2021-bss-eval and we will be accepting responses only until 3 p.m. today. Uh, do visit our website at mnh dot uplb.edu.ph if you want to drop us an email just write us at mnh.uplb at up.edu.ph we are on facebook twitter youtube and instagram and uh, the recording of this um, session will be uploaded to our youtube channel later just look for the uh, handle uh, uplb museum so you can also check our uh, articles at Wikipedia and TripAdvisor. So, hanapin nyo lang po ang UPLB Museum of Natural History. And with that, maraming salamat po. See you on Wednesday. We have um, a webinar. Our speaker will be Ma'am Lysel Magtoto of UP Baguio. And we hope that uh, makikita pa namin kayo ulit uh, on Wednesday. So, with that, maraming salamat. Ma'am Des, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Uh, it-